You're listening to the Game Street Dot Biz Microcast, recorded on Monday, the 28th of October, 2024. I'm James Batchelor. I'm editor in chief of Game Street Dot Biz, and joining me, as always, uh, is, is slightly unusually, is a post EGX Chris Dring, head of Game Street Dot Biz. Chris, how are you feeling? I've, I'm, got, I'm losing my voice, and I think this is going to be quite um, um, entertaining because uh, you're probably going to hear me because. The, this bit's recorded on Monday. <laughs> the um, the uh, the other bit of the middle our interview in the middle of this podcast is recorded on Friday, and you're going to hear my voice improve over the um, over the course of the show. It's the audio equivalent of before and after, but you're getting the after first, essentially. Yeah. I have to say, I really enjoyed um, EGX slash MCM this year. Um, mm. I, I, I'm look. I actually worked on the show this year, so I, I was involved in it. So big, 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 you know, caveat. <laughs> the, um, and um, but you know, we I had fun. I we had a load of retro panels. Did a session with Casper uh, Field and Keith Stewart. Twenty five years of Dreamcast, and there was um, and I loved that session. And we did thirty years of Dogcon Country with the original DK team. I had a lot of fun. Um, and there was actually quite a lot because it's part of MCM. There was a lot more to do overall the show this year. So there was, I mean, not games wise. I think that's mm. there's something that frustrates me a little bit, and it frustrates me not just with related to EGX. It actually relates to quite a few things. Is I still see comments on social media about oh, what have they done to EGX or what they changed about EGX? Why is EGX like this? And what they mean is, you know, EGX used to be a show full of AAA games right you'd go here's the microsoft booth here's the yay booth here's the ubisoft booth and you'd be awash with big fancy stands with and it used to be great and now it's a lot more indie games there's uh esports stuff and there's some good stuff this year there was lego horizon was there there were star wars outlaws i think it was supposed to be assassin's creed but star wars outlaws now tekken i 8 did tournament. wonder that yeah tekken 8 tournament was there um there was lots of cool stuff um still to do at the show but it wasn't anything like it used to be and there's a couple of, and but when I see industry people sort of complain about it, or at least bring it up, or or, address, or talk about it, and one of the things I think is a little bit unfair is this isn't an event organizer's decision, right? Mm. It isn't the the decision for Nintendo not to go to the show wasn't because the event organizer didn't want Nintendo at the show. Um, these things are harder to justify ROI wise, as in it. But we there was a time when an industry used to come together and go, we want this, so we want Gamescom, or we want Paris Games Week, or we want uh, it doesn't, not just. E3 is the best, is our biggest example, and I was going to end on that one. Yes. But yeah, it, it, and it's the same. So when I see people in the UK go, why does the UK not have, no, it's not just EGX, WASD is gone, WASD, the indie event, is gone. Mm. Um, Insomnia is gone. The UK has lost all of its centralised, bigger bigger events. There's lots of cool, sustainable, nice, smaller events that sort of tour the country. They're, they're still going. But EGX is the only one that's left, and it's had to merge with Comic-Con in order to be justifiable. And that's an industry decision. And... Um, if we as an industry are going, hey, how come Paris Games Week's got this big event that's got 300,000 people to it? And why doesn't our London Games Festival have that? Why is, um, um, uh, why does Games, why is Games, why is, why is the biggest European trade show in Germany? If you're asking these questions and you're thinking the UK is the biggest market for, uh, for consumers buying video games, the UK is number one. And when you start, you go, well, that's, that's on us as the industry to make that happen. I thought EGS was pretty good. I think the fact this merged with Comic-Con actually gives it a, a different feel to it, a different edge to it that other events don't have. I hope they do more. I would love them to see, obviously they were a bit constrained with some space because there was a hall missing and stuff like that. But um, because of something completely out of their control. But um, I, I think, um, I thought it was a good show. And I think I'd love to see the industry I mean, it's, the industry's never going to get back, back behind it in the same way as it used to because there aren't that many games that come out, mm. right? There just there just isn't the lineup at, uh, at Q4 or whatever for that for AAA lineup. That is, there's obviously loads of games that come out um, that uh, that can justify that kind of investment. That you know, but um, there's other ways of getting involved. And I'll say this: like, I sit there saying the industry didn't get behind it. They did. You know, Ubisoft was there. I mentioned Star Wars Outlaws. Bandai Namco was there. They had the big Tekken 8 tournament. Microsoft was there. They didn't show any games for you to play. But we had a session on one stage with Avowed. The Obsidian team came over. And um, there was CFE's team. And if you actually watch the CFE, if you're a CFE's fan, try and get hold of that. Uh, try and find out what they said during that session because they announced a lot of stuff about CFE's. And there was like um, uh, EA came with Dragon Age. We had a big Bioware session. There was, again, not playable game, but it was there. So in the industry, and MCM EGX is moving towards more community stuff. There's ways of, of supporting it without having to, um, you know, spend money on booths and stuff if that's not something that works for you. But I just think, mm. I think it was a good show and I hope the industry... Um, can support it because if they don't I do worry that you know we when the UK industry will end up without an event at all but anyway that's my I had a little had a little rant in my head about it <laughs> in the, I guess it was kind of a rant but anyway 
Did you enjoy it, James? You were there on the Friday. I, I did. I, I I barely saw the show floor, though. Like I was only there the Friday, and I was obviously upstairs for the EGXM summit, like, you know, the business stuff for most of it. Um, but I got, like, an hour around the store, around the show floor. Um, and, and you're right, like... It, Combining with MCM, it gave it a very different feel. It felt a lot bigger, um, but in terms of playable games wise, it felt a lot smaller. And as you say, as you say, that's not the event organisers; that is the industry not yeah. putting things out. The, you know, the the day I was there Friday is the day that Call of Duty came out. And you would have thought, like, you know, in the past, you'd have been playing Call of Duty in what September ahead of a November release, or maybe you know, October ahead of a November release. It's the day of Call of Duty coming out, and there wasn't any copies on the show floor to there play. Was, that, actually, if you went was to there was actually. If you, if, you, if you went to the, um, uh, there's like just a general play area, they had Call of Duty on there. It was there, right. and, 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 but yeah, I know what you mean. It wasn't You know what I mean? Like, big, it used to, it it used have, to be the. It didn't used have to a be big the, Activision booth. No. No, exactly. Um, like, and, and, that's and the, you're, the show's moving towards that, though. I think it's about, and I think yeah, Comic Con does it this way. You know, you go to EGX, not necessarily to play the latest games, but to hang out with your friends. Yeah. You know, I, think, I, think, I think it's really great that the whole Sea of Thieves community in the UK come to EGX, like a little pilgrimage every uh, every set because they know rare are going to be there with a panel the sea of thieves influencers are going to be there they all get dressed up as pirates and and sort of um and hang out of each other i think that's the way events are going but um obviously egx has a certain expectation around it that um um certain people have which is you know changed it's changed it's not it's changed for quite a while now yeah no that's true i'm i'm intrigued to see how they they do going forward and but and, and i'm agreeing with you i think you're absolutely right i think the industry needs to get behind this sort of thing a bit more. And yes, there are different ways of doing that, but I, I wouldn't want to see like the, the game playing part of it go away because that is, well, yeah, that's I'd just... love to see more indies. Like I think, I think, I, I, yeah. yeah, I know what you mean. The game playing part of it's really cool, but I actually, there was, there was some, there was some decent, really, there wasn't as many indie games this year, but there were some really, really no. good ones. I played Dunk Dunk, which was fantastic, by the way. <laughs> um, the Platonic Friends game before it was great. But yeah, there's, um there was some, there was some, there was still, and I played a bunch of games and I had a lot of fun, but, and what was great about it though, there wasn't, you know, EGX in, you know, pros pandemic last year was pretty good actually, but um, the previous years, you sort of, you'd seen the show after about three, four hours. And yeah. whereas this time, you know, because there's all that MCM stuff and there were so many more stages and signings and meet and greets and all that kind of stuff, which is what Comic-Con does. You know, I had, I had a couple of, I, a couple of people that I, mates that came along that I know, they, they, they came back the next day you know they were yeah. they hadn't finished so that was great a friend of mine was there for for th the full three days and he didn't manage mm. to do everything he wanted to do so that that is a sign of a, of a healthier event so yeah yeah intrigued to see how all this kind of evolves over the years to come like certainly intrigued to see how egx will fare as part of mcm comic-con but mm. the, believe it or not that's not what we were here to talk about this week no no um as, as you alluded to, we do have a, a main interview to be getting to. Before we do that, I kind of want to run through a couple of news stories from the past week. It wasn't overly busy news-wise last week. Um, I think we're going through a bit of a calmer period. Um, there were a couple of stories I wanted to pick up on. Um, I'm going to touch briefly on, you ran a piece, Call of Duty Black Ops 6 could boost Game Pass subscribers by 2.5 million to 4 million. Um, now, I put this in when we were <laughs> planning to record this on Friday, because I thought, oh, you can talk about this uh, great piece you did about analysts talking about how much of a business moment this is, but given your, uh, your failing voice, <laughs> How, how deeply do you want to delve into it today? Well, I mean, I guess I guess it's an interesting one, right? You know, this I, I'm really wary that this could easily have been. What do the numbers mean? Um, but the um, um, what, what, <clears throat> what I think is really important is that, um, and it's Pactor says um, Michael Pactor, you won't love him or hate him, right? He's right. Call of Duty sales are going to be, you know, down, and that is sort of going to be the headline. But I really think that obviously it doesn't paint what they're trying to do. You know, we know Microsoft's trying to drive Game Pass subscribers with this. What's really interesting is a sort of sort of split in how many numbers i think I, I do think michael's number was more like plucked out of the air than mm. ampere's estimate which is around two two and a half million um more subscribers to game pass that's actually a considerable number and i think whether that's a good news or not for the industry is, is sort of your, down to your perspective because two million more people in a subscription service getting access to such a wide array of new game array of games including brand new ones may not be seen as necessarily a good thing for i don't know dragon age which is coming out the week afterwards, right? And um, um, uh, or in the uh, you know or um, or you know if you've got a big game coming up and suddenly you're competing with a service like Game Pass, and so the more millions of people that's in Game Pass, that's that's potentially a bit of a stress for some companies. But at the same time, it means that Game Pass now has an even bigger audience, in which if you put your game into it, you can potentially find quite a quite good player number. Of course, the success of it is always going to be based on how many people are still subscribing to Game Pass in January. 
or in February. So that is always going to be the biggest, the biggest challenge. Yeah, absolutely. And we've been talking about this around subscriptions, like the amount of people who might sign up to a service for a specific title, essentially effectively rent it and then you know sign off or cancel the subscription as and when they've played what they wanted to play um i mean i'm increasingly tempted to try that myself i'll be honest um but yeah it's going to be interesting to see the see the numbers come february i also kind of caveat again we're recording monday morning uk time and um, the game came out friday for all we know this afternoon they could announce that this is the biggest call of duty launch ever so we don't know um I mean, I, I do kind of miss that. It feels like it's been slower, but it used to be like within 24 hours of a, of a Call of Duty game coming out, they used to announce like our record sales, etc. And we tend to have to wait a little bit longer for those numbers. Um, but yeah, the, the main message from this um, was always that a lot of the conversation has been around Game Pass, particularly since the Activision Blizzard acquisition. If Call of Duty can't grow Game Pass, what can now there's semantics in that and like as much as we can surmise what microsoft's strategy is we don't really know what they're discussing behind door closed doors but if you've got the biggest franchise in the industry in terms of you know the biggest annual franchise in the industry and it doesn't go your service you do have to question what's next how they're going to adapt we don't know like the, the analysts seem to be predict. you know the analysts that chris spoke to seem to be fairly confident that this will do what microsoft hope that it will drive people to subscribe as you say, Chris, whether or not they stay subscribed, that is a different matter. Yeah. But I'm intrigued. Maybe they'll follow this up with, you know, you know, in the wake of, um, you know, Black Ops 6's launch, like around the sort of time that people will start to kind of churn, or if they start seeing churn, they'll start bringing some of the classic Call of Duties to, you know, the back catalogue. I'm still, we've said this before, I'm still surprised the back catalogue is not on Game Pass yet, well, but I guess that's something they can roll out. Well, I, I use the thing with subscription service. We get this a lot. I get it. I used to go on Nintendo forums, and they all get really annoyed with how slow Nintendo are at rolling out all their back catalogue on to Nintendo Switch Online. There's a strategy to this. There's got mm. to be. It's all about, you know, giving people a regular drip feed of, of things to play and experience rather than going, hey, here's all it is up front, up front at once. And the other thing is worth saying that I actually think two and a half million is obviously a huge number of players. Oh yeah, but it isn't. But it isn't. It isn't where I. F I think we were thinking Game Pass was going to end up. Right. I think we need hundreds of millions of players if that's going yeah. to become the dominant service. I don't think Microsoft thinks it is going to be anymore, and I think that's why they're putting more of their games on PlayStation Five because I think they know in order to generate better um, margins on their games, they're going to have to find audiences outside of Game Pass for those titles. What I think is interesting as well, but I do think they have a chance because not only is Call of Duty a game that is a live service multiplayer game, so you it will keep people engaged beyond the launch window anyway. Um, but for months and months and months but also they've got indiana jones in december they've got avowed in february they've got quite a nice spread of titles sort of coming out over the next few months that they can sort of use as big moment uh, big moments for these what i found interesting is a lot of the marketing around call of duty doesn't seem to talk about game pass very much mm. um i don't know if that if why why that is um um but but generally speaking i'm um i'm i'm i think it's worth a moment game pass makes money I know that that's partly because it, you know, it has its first party games that um, they don't, you know, for, it, it is impacting the commercials of the first party titles, but it isn't Game Pass itself is a sustainable business model. And, um, and I think it's just a business model, but like everything, there's so many of these models that are causing problems, not just, in fact, I wouldn't even say Game Pass is the worst one. Fortnite, Roblox is um, uh, things like um, uh, uh uh, uh, all these things but if, if, even outside of games netflix all these massive services that are soaking up time and that's the thing right it's the time that's the problem and mm. some of these games are just too long some hundreds of hours long these games and we're sitting there trying to go oh the mark is not you know that's what's causing competition in the marketplace and there's that news you stat about eight percent of play time so the eight percent of time that was spent on playing games last year was spent on new games and the rest of it was spent on either old games or live service games or games with annualized franchises like foot fifa and, and ea sports fc and madden and all those sort of titles and you sit there and you go there's just not uh there's not you're not there's not much time in the market you're competing over and when you've got something like game pass that's that's impacting that even more but you could also argue because of services like game pass you have more of a chance if you can get your game into that service and you can make the commercials work for you that gives you an opportunity to find a big audience when in a market where it's increasingly hard to do so so depending on your point of view, really, whether or not Game Pass is a good thing or not. Um, and, um, uh, and But I do, Call of Duty is going to move the needle. Is it going to move the needle enough to make it the dominant business model? I don't think so. Um, and then the question is whether or not those millions of new subscribers stay in, stay in, stay in the service or not. Another story I wanted to talk about was um, with this couple of legal stories from Europe that came up over the uh, last week. Uh, first one is the European Court of Justice weighed in on a 
dispute in the German courts between Sony Interactive Entertainment and Dattel. I think it's Dattel. Uh, the people who make Action Replay. Now, this is weird. This is a case that dates back to 2012. It is Sony suing Dattel over Action Replay for PSP. Yeah. Um, I've missed the PSP. Um, about, you know, cheats that the Action Replay provided. Things like, you know, infinite boosts in Motorstorm Arctic Edge is the example that was given. Um, the German courts... You know, suggested that this doesn't that the action replay doesn't infringe on Sony's rights because it doesn't technically change the game itself. It doesn't change anything in the infrastructure. It just tweaks a few variables, kind of behind the scenes. I don't know the full technicalities of how it works, but their argument was it doesn't it doesn't alter the game itself, and therefore it doesn't violate on Sony's rights. They passed the European Court of Justice to get their uh, response. The European Court. Of, Court of Justice recently replied, and they agreed, yes. Um, they said that Action Replay does not change or reproduce either the object code, the source code, or the internal structure and organization of Sony software. Instead, it merely changes the content of the variables temporarily transferred by Sony's games to the console's RAM, which are used during the running of the game. Now, the reason I bring this up is... I think I already saw a few messages that this is going to be, be a win for cheap providers. So things like we've just seen AIM junkies uh, in recent months being sued by Bungie and you know losing heavily, like massive multi-million dollar set settlement. This is not quite the win for cheap providers that it seems to be. I have, um, we should have going up in the next week or so from uh, a couple of legal experts, a feature on why that is. Um, I haven't... <laughs> I'll be virtually honest. I haven't read the haven't read the full piece yet. But the basic gist is like this is not because this is such a different situation. This is not the out for cheap providers. But it just, it just made me. I found it interesting that you know a case, a case dating back to 2012. You know about you know company it shows how long companies have been kind of battling against you know platform holders yeah. have been battling against cheats providers, and then the fact that the cheats providing. Um, the, the method of providing cheats, you know, you don't need an action replay anymore. The method of providing cheats has, has evolved so much that, you know, it's just a whole different legal issue now. Yeah, I found well, that interesting. Uh, it's well, also action replay. I think it, it's nuanced. Well, I had an action replay on the N64. Did, I don't know if you did, James. I did, and yeah. The, and the reason why I did it was so I wanted to unlock those levels they hadn't finished in Goldeneye, those multiplayer levels. <laughs> exactly the same, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and they were a bit rough and they weren't, clearly weren't finished. But, you know, that's why I did it for. And in that sense, I'm like, surely that's okay. Um, I think I use it to get to that secret island on Dam. There's nothing there, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, but it was like it's um, and um, and you sort of think, well, that's not you know, it's not how it's intended to play. It's not the end of the world. Interestingly, and I mentioned this Dreamcast 25 panel at EGX. Did you know Keith Stewart when he was the editor of a Dreamcast magazine got blacklisted from Sega? because he put an action replay disc on the cover of Dreamcast UK. No magazine. way. Yeah. He put it on the cover because it was, it was about helping import games from Japan. Yeah. But Sega were furious and, um, and blacklisted a Dreamcast magazine over the, over the thing. It, it, you know, it, it, that was about imports really. But um, yeah, it's, uh, but obviously that the situation we're talking, I, mean, I don't, I haven't read your legal piece either, James. I haven't, it hasn't been on the site yet, but, um, <laughs> but um, um, I'm, I'm imagining the, uh, the, uh, uh, the situation of a cheat now in an age of esports and online gaming and that kind of thing that it's 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 That's damaging the, to the product if you the, that. the the context is completely different isn't it yeah the action replay on n64 the action replay on psp like back in the day when online gaming was less prominent or in the n64's era not existent cheats would like you're not cheating anyone but yourself like you're you're it, it doesn't affect things in single player games do not affect the wider community whereas so many games now are as you say live service online multiplayer and you have to think about the entire community the balance you know all these cheap providers and all the you know the aiming bots and things like this are disrupting the balance of the game if they disrupt the balance of the game it deters other players which you know limits the audience or diminishes the audience which diminishes the potential revenue returns like all these different things like cheap have become so much more damaging to video games now than they used to be uh, back in the action replay days. Um, it's just, it's just interesting. It's an interesting example of how far that has evolved in what you know, twelve years. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, last story I want to talk about before we dive into our main uh, topic and our main interview is uh, an Austrian court has found that FIFA Ultimate Team Packs are not gambling. EA has won a key court case in Austria over whether or not loot boxes should be classified as gambling. The higher regional court of Vienna concluded that loot boxes in FIFA 23 are not gambling because the player in question does not acquire FIFA Ultimate Team Packs with the intent to generate profit, but purely to use them in the game. After assessing the Austrian Gaming Act, the court ruled that because the economic risk is not present in this case, there's no economic risk, it does not count as a game of chance. I know people who will disagree with this. I know people who will agree with this. The FIFA for ultimate team debate continues. 
Well, I think it's all, I think gambling is a distraction and we need to move on from it. The, um, the, the, um, that story. So EA's actually won quite a lot of cases across Austria. It's lost a couple as well, but in the lower regional courts, the higher regional court going, no, actually we agree with the majority of the lower regional courts is a big win for EA. Um, but the next step will be taking it to, um, um, the uh the if it go if there's if they appeal it'll go to the supreme court and the supreme court that decision will set it, the precedent for it <clears throat> but i think i say this all the time obsessing over whether it's gambling or not kind of misses the point mm. the point is is this potentially damaging is this a good thing for uh that kids to be involved in to get that hook on to or that that buzz of opening packs and stuff is that a good thing do we want our kids spending loads of money on this sort of stuff um, no we don't but we're sort of trying to shoehorn it into existing gambling laws. It's not really a gam. It's not gambling in the way that you know betting on horses is gambling. Um, so it's. I think it requires its own moral compass. It requires its own rules and regulations, um, rather than trying to just obsess on whether it's gambling or not. I think it. This is the point. Is it gambling? Probably not. Is it a problem? Yes, it is. Right, and that and that. But being obsessed with the technicalities and whether what what. What, what classification we need to give it is sort of distracting us from actually just looking at the issue and going, actually, we as an industry, what do we feel um, we should be doing here? You know, who do we, where do we think the line is? Setting that line and and and, and making sure that we're coordinated in, in delivering on that rather than waiting for all these government bodies and, and legal lawyers to decide whether or not it fits into an existing laws. We've gone on a lot longer than I planned to with the... Uh... The new section, which ironically I still have in my notes as things we don't have time to talk about. So we're going to move on into our main uh, topic. We had an interview at EGX with Amanda Cruz of Big Fan Games. It was a really, really fun discussion. So we'll pass on to that now. We're joined by Amanda Cruz from Big Fan Games. Amanda, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me. We're recording live. Uh, we're, well, we're, we always record live. We always record live. <laughs> no, we're recording in person. Yeah, yeah. In a, in a stolen room somewhere at the Excel Center. Yeah, so. we were, we were at um, MCM Comic Con, uh, London Comic Con, and EGX, where, and you've just come off a panel about. What was the panel about? IP. It was it was the golden age of adaptations, essentially, like how games, TV, crea- uh, TV, and Hollywood are coming to create to build worlds together, mm. which is a grand topic. And we, I think we kind of got to that, didn't we? <laughs> a little bit in there. <laughs> it, it, the trouble is, it's such a big topic with um, IP. I found myself getting confused on the panel alone because like, there's, there's the two directions. You've got bringing games IP into other forms of medium. Yeah. And then you've got bringing other, other IP from other mediums into games. And both ways are difficult. And kind of, as you said in the, the interview that uh, you did with Chris a few, uh, a few weeks back, there's an art to adapting these. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was good, though. It was really, it was really interesting. I, it, the, the, the relationship between games, TV and film seem... I mean, I, 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 well, I've gone through rounds of this when suddenly everyone, uh, you know, everyone says, oh, music industry is taking games seriously, for instance. Completely different industry. But, uh, and they go, I go, well, they did during Guitar Hero as well. This isn't the first time that we've yeah. gone through these sort of relationships. But it does feel like the movies and TV world and games worlds seem to be closer than they've ever been. Um, and at least from an outside perspective. Is that, is that how you feel? it? I, I think so. And I think like, and I, we talked a little bit about this on the panel. I think part of it comes from just, just the executives being at the level of people who grew up with it are now mm. at the decision-making level. So you're not explaining to people who are actually making the decisions, why decisions are being made or even explaining why something is cool. I think in my, the younger part of my career, I definitely did a ton of that. And not only is it huge time waste, but it, it ultimately creates it's a disconnect, mm. right? Whereas now, half the time I say something is cool, I you know I go call up John Drake at Disney and I go, oh man, I've got this really specific alien pitch, and he's like, absolutely, yes, amazing, <laughs> and we should do this, this, and this. You know what I mean? And so yeah. they're adding on to it, and it's just way more of a collaboration, and there's just organic excitement. Mm. Whereas before, I think you were unfortunately selling it. At least this was my experience. You were selling it on no, no, we should make this movie adaptation of this game because these numbers and all these things that really aren't what's exciting about doing an adaptation. Mm. It does seem harder than ever, though. I mean, I, I look at the... Obviously, I, we, do, we do a little section at the end of the podcast all about numbers. And you see Avatar didn't do that amazing. Suicide Squad missed. And then you got Star Wars that you know Ubisoft were disappointing in the numbers. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't 
what they wanted. Mm. And then you've got something like Warhammer 40,000 Space Marine 2, <laughs> which goes and breaks all franchise records. Um, and I'd love to tell you why Star Wars missed. I can't really work I it out. I still can't work uh, it And, out. and yeah. I, I mean, I can, there's some things I can talk about, but it's I, but I find it, um, obviously, I appreciate you're not going to start naming, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, discuss it, but it's, um, you talked about it being an art to it. But, I, but isn't that quite interesting, right? Because you look at something like like Mario, yeah. right, which crushed at the box mm. office, and and um, you know I'm I'm actually um, quite good friends with there's there's this incredible Japanese rights attorney, and she is she is just the master class of translation. And I don't really mean that from a language perspective, but she has such an incredible love for Japanese IP. And she is the primary broker of most of those relationships. So it starts from a place where she understands Hollywood. She lives between LA and Tokyo, mm. right? But she did the deal on Mario. I believe she also did Detective Pikachu. Oh, nice. She was everything I pursued in the anime or Japanese space. And it wasn't that I couldn't call those people on my own. It wasn't that there was an actual literal language barrier, but she understood how to bridge the gap, right? Mm -hmm. And I think those those people are critical mm -hmm. and really, really hard to find. And it's a huge part of why those projects work. Now, that said, Chris Villadondri, who runs Illumination, is also obsessed <laughs> <laughs> with Mario. And it is like, he will he will die to be that person and to be the person that brings that forward. And I also think that energy is very real. That's true of Mary Parent, who runs... Um, even if you don't know her, this is the very famous thing about Mary Parent who runs all the film at Legendary is that she is a Pokemon fanatic. Mm. You cannot test her and win. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think that's, I think that's the, that's a really powerful thing when you have people who are at the head of, they're not just some person in that department, but you have the mm. person who runs it going, hell yes, we are making Pokemon. It has continued. Incredible. So hell yes, we're making Pokemon. Hell yes, we're making Pokemon. And then going the and going the other way, right? I've done two, you know, I'll toot my own horn, right? But, but it's one of my most prized relationships is when you get to be a fan of someone and then you get to work with them. I was a huge fan of Thomas Was Alone way mm -hmm. back when. Mm -hmm. And now I've gotten to do two games with, you know, the incredible Mike Biffle. <laughs> and he's just... He's a dream to work with. He's and it's it's so fun to work with him because he's not only really good at making the games, but he's really an incredibly strong communicator. And mm. when we did the John Wick game with him back when I was at Lionsgate, it was effortless to put him in a room with the filmmakers and Derek Kolstad, who created the series, and have him speak to why he wanted to tell a story. And he came up with that game, the narrative of it exists between movie one and movie two. And all of that was him and mm -hmm. him figuring out. He wrote all the dialogue and we loved it, right? And similarly, uh, I did the Hellboy game a few years back and we did not do the movie rights. We did a partnership with Mike Mignola himself and Dark Horse. And you can't be canon unless you are a comic. Comics have very serious yeah. rules about what makes them canon or not. But we chose a piece of the timeline where you don't know where Hellboy is in the, in the books. Mm. And that's what we wrote into. And we had um, Dean, who's most, I think most well known for writing the Fable series, uh, brought just an incredible in-depth narrative to it that is, I, I think doesn't get as enough attention for how proud I am of the narrative of that game. And then the art, the art director there, Patty, just crushed Manuela style, which is very specific and actually not very easy to translate to games. So I guess what you're saying is, I'm not, not to name names, but the, it's all about getting the right people yes. who are who can really get that fan understanding and that authenticity. Yeah. Into it. I mean, I do. I think I watch Detective Pikachu. Um, it's one of my. We watch it a lot. It's, 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 it, we, we bought it. You know, actually bought the digital download of it. And there's that bit in the po Detective Pikachu where Ryan Reynolds as Pikachu is, is singing the Pokemon theme song. Yeah. Yeah. Like, the <laughs> which is the best thing that's not in the trailer. The, the, rest, the best things are in the trailer, except for that one bit. Yeah. And I thought, oh, the fan wrote that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was a very. You could tell that was that. You know. But what I'm loving is that the right people. Going back to what you were saying about Mike Bithell can be indies. I love that we're now at a stage where, and big fans obviously working on this, that indies are going to have the chance to make these sort of things. Like it was, you kind of assume, right, massive brand, you know, huge Hollywood hit like a John Wick, it's going to have to be like a AAA first person shooter. Yeah. But there is scope for smaller studios to flex their creative talents on, you know, established IP. And I think that's brilliant. And I kind of want, I'm intrigued to see how far that goes, like how, how many more titles like that we'll see and what they'll, what they'll do. 
Yeah. And I think, well, because we're early in the conversation, this is part of why I personally like to target things that are not necessarily new. John Wick was different. Hmm. John Wick was an indie film. And even at Lionsgate, we didn't know hmm. that it was going to be the John Wick franchise no, course, at, that, no. at that juncture. In fact, uh, I don't know, because I wasn't here when they signed that movie, but lore was that we passed on it um, because the first John Wick movie is actually an acquisition. And from an, from an initial standpoint, I totally get that because if you pitched me a movie at that point in Keanu's career, he was not the Keanu Sans we know now. <laughs> um, and you said Keanu Reeves' dog gets shot five minutes into a movie, I'd be like, oh my God, nobody wants to see that on a Friday night. <laughs> like, what are you talking about, right? So the journey of that is really interesting, but, we, but, but Lionsgate is uniquely entrepreneurial, I think, in the way mm -hmm. that many major studios only really can be, and that's also like legendary in those smaller places as opposed to Warner's. Um, but on the other side of doing indie games, I think we're early in the conversation, which is why I target the back catalog stuff, because I do think we're getting more and more good licensed games and people are playing more and more things mm. than that conversation will, will go. But I worry about what you say. And I think if you sign the big Star Wars game, it's hard and people yeah. will expect the big polished thing. Yeah. So if you do an IP like Hanna-Barbera, that's great because people have a lot of resonance with it, but they don't necessarily expect to have that expectation that it's going to be the super blown out, big budget game. Mm. Do you not think though, we have a risk of talking debt? Cause I, here's a thing, I know that there's indies that are like three or four people that can make a, um, a small game, but there's an indie game. It's not an indie game. There was a, we've had a boxing game come out. Yeah. You've seen it undisputed made by, okay, the team's now 70 people. So it's not tiny, they're an independent team. They started off three people in a bedroom, right? And they had all the boxing licenses, not all of them, but like, there's more fighters than any other boxing game. Come on to a million copies. They're basically going up against the sort of the, the sports rival now to EA and 2K, right? And and I and I think back to like the Aliens versus Predators and the Golden Eyes and all that kind of stuff of the big hit license titles of the 90s. And sure, some of them were Disney, but a lot of them were, were Rebellion before Rebellion is what it is now. Yeah. A lot of it was um, you know kids out of university making a James Bond game. Yeah. And so this idea that um, oh, it's cool. It? Yeah, it, yeah, sure. You, people have an expectation that Star Wars is going to be AAA, right? It's going to have that sort of budget. But the idea, oh, indies can make licensed games now too. They always probably, I think we have, we risk of talking them down a bit. They, yeah. yeah, they did. They did. They did. And like, I, yeah, I think that a lot of the, the sort of greats that you would point to were technically indies. I just think that we're, we, I, people are fatigued by the, by the brand slapping. Yeah. Right. And that, and that's where that feeling comes from where it's just like, oh, everything is just, they just rushed that out to yeah. market a movie. Cause there wasn't a, there was a whole era. I feel like the two thousands was especially bad for this oh, where yeah. they were like, let's try to jam some kind of terrible mobile game out alongside. It's merchandise. Yeah. So games yeah. as merchandise rather than as a, as a, and form like, of I, I remember like there was a point where the, there was always like a game of the film, but it yes. got to the stage where actually they started to make a game alongside the film. So the two I'm thinking of are the, the amazing Spider-Man games that went outside the, the alongside, they released in time for the Andrew Garfield films, yeah. but they weren't the game of the film. They were the game alongside, they were the game that happened afterwards. So like they had a yeah. original, they were essentially original Spider-Man games that kind of fit just after the movie because yeah. they knew they wouldn't be able to turn it around in time. And then Toy Story 3, that was game of the film, but more than half the game was this original sandbox mode because they knew they weren't going to be able to rush it in time because films don't films are quicker to produce than video games. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But didn't it, that's, even then, like people, we talk, we have this, like games used to be like this. But actually, I, it was a long time ago now, and I think... Even like, somebody brought up the James Bond game. Was it Everything or Nothing or whatever? Mm. Was that, and I'm like, actually, was that the unofficial Pierce Brosnan? Final? I certainly see it that way. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, it's his final film. And it's like, because it had a, a list cast and original music. And it was like, and that was 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. this isn't, this isn't, it's an it's old, not it's a bit about dated conversation, really. Yeah. But, um, it, but it is great to see um, things like, you know, Mike Biffle and, and those sort of games. Um, well, and a tour, right? And I think that's a very filmic process because. Uh, and, 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 or at least I'm at least, I mean, I'm hoping other people do it this way, but I, I have found that that's kind of blown people's mind when I tell them that, like, for me, it's like more interesting to find the developer and then find what they're excited about and mm -hmm. apply it that way, because that's what I would have done in film. I would, I, yes, you can, if you own a franchise in a movie studio, maybe you're trying to exploit that. You're trying to get different directors to pitch on it, but it was always way more exciting when someone like Sam Raimi came in and said, well, I love this book series. Will you buy it? for mm. me to make that, that always netted out in a better project in my experience yeah yeah when it comes from 
Um, how has it been since Big Fan's broken cover? Have you have been inundated with? Oh that? yeah, people people <laughs> love it. People love it and have brought us really cool pitches. Really, really interesting people have reached out. You were getting pitched after the panel, like we've just yeah. <laughs> yeah. this swarm of developers hit, and, the, hit the front of the room. And it's awesome. And the and and the 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 types of people and the caliber of people have been incredibly impressive. So I, I, I'm really, really excited about that. And I'm glad that we didn't, you know, before we went fully public with the effort, I'm glad we didn't kind of sign away all our slots because yeah. now I'm like, wow, I have kind of an embarrassment of riches. Oh, like, that's great. Cool maybes. Well, I hope we can get a Doctor, Doctor Who game. That's my, uh, that's my, my dream. Yeah. <laughs> Amanda, thank you so much for joining us. That is all, all we've got time for. But um, thank you so much. And hopefully we can have you back on again another time. Yeah. Thank you, guys. It was yeah. really fun. Enjoy Yeah. Well, uh, you enjoy your uh, your waiting in the teams desperate to, uh, to pitch you. <laughs> They're at the door. <laughs> <laughs>
mainly because the AAA games weren't here this year. We didn't have Hogwarts. We haven't had Diablo. We hadn't had uh, uh, Tears of the Kingdom. We had all that last year. We had Resident Evil 4 last year and Star Wars Jedi Survivor last year and Starfield last year. And this year we haven't had any ga- games anywhere like that. And the one game that I thought would have been a bit like that, Star Wars Outlaws, missed. But because of games like Helldivers and stuff like that, we've actually managed to do quite well and also the success of legacy games. So I think that's okay. But obviously at the end of the year, there's no denying it. It's going to be, even if we have a good Q4, I think in real terms when we look at the um uh when we look at uh we can't factor in inflation it's going to be another declining year for the games industry but we did predict this like this isn't a oh my god we're down well, this wasn't expected i think we all expected it and um, i think next year we expect to do a little bit better so yeah the sakanas came out and uh yeah there's some interesting information in there some data in there and a good result for ea i think but overall september sales are down six percent but as i say i think when we if we those digital missing sales will, would have made up for that a little bit it's not going to be a, a dramatic decline for the whole year either is it it's going to be no i think it's not i i, I my view is it's done better than i thought it, it was going to do yeah. I, I i was expecting a bit of a brutal year and it is going to be a brutal year. it is going to be a decline and there's no hiding from that and it's not going to make good reading for investors and all that sort of stuff but it is a weak year for game releases you know at one point it looked like christmas might be okay because you had a big assassin's creed and a big call of duty but then they delayed assassin's creed so um it's you know we've got a bigger call of duty but it's going to be in game pass the numbers will be down in terms of pure yeah. premium sales so it's 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 going to be a bit tough. Dragon Age, I think, I think Dragon Age looks amazing, but I'm a little bit anxious about its performance, actually, um, because there I, seems to be a lack of buzz around it. I, th- I think at this stage of the series, like, <clears throat> I think at this stage of the Dragon Age series, you're four games in. It's been quite an experimental series in terms of each game has... Uh, it's not a game that's got a very kind of consistent structure. You know, two is very different to Origins, Inquisition... Gameplay-wise, yeah. Gameplay-wise, etc. yeah. So I think by this point, you... This one of those RPG things that like began as a an RPG game that was trying to get into a much larger audience. Two definitely tried to go a bit more mainstream because it went a little bit more Mass Effect than uh, than than CRPG. And by the fourth game, I think it knows its audience and it's got a specific audience it's targeting rather than trying to reach the masses. So I don't. It's going to be huge for Dragon Age and RPG fans. I don't. I oh, don't think fans, we live in we live in we live in a post Baldur's Gate world, right? <laughs> no, that's like, true. Know, that and, is true. And, and it, it's 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 also one of the only AAA titles outside of Call of Duty coming out this Christmas, and it's, yeah. it's from EA. It looks really lovely. Um, we had bio. I spoke to some of the Bioware team at the at the weekend, and it was and and they're they're really happy. It looks polished. It doesn't look, doesn't look like it's it's broken in any way. I've heard good things about it. Um, so I, I'm a, I'm a little surprised there's a lack of excitement about it. But hey, I think this can go either way. We live in a we live in an attention uh, world where you know I think the game might not have the biggest launch, but if it if it um if it resonates very well, if it reviews well, if the fans like it then it could blow up, right? We, I've yeah. seen games come out of almost nowhere and just explode onto the scene. Um, you know, even games like Helldivers grew year, week on week on week on week. It could happen that way, or it could even do a Star Wars Outlaws and, you know, disappoint and then continue to do so. I don't know. A little bit anxious about it. I hope it does well, because I think it looks great. Um, and one thing, I'll, um, so that's looking forward. The last thing the numbers mean, it's a bit of an eclectic list of stuff I'm talking about this week. Um, Mario Party Jamboree. Now, if you'd have asked me how I thought that game was going to do, I would have said, like, you know, rein in your expectations on this one. I know the game reviewed well, but it's the third Mario Party on the Switch, right? We're at the end of the Switch life cycle. I'm not expecting this to be a big seller at launch, certainly. The thing is with Mario Party games is they do well over time. They, you know, they're not about, hey, we're going to make massive amount of money in week one and then and then it fades away. It is a game that um, sells and sells and sells and sells. Jamboree has been a real breakout hit in my mind. Like it has exceeded my expectations massively. In in the uh, UK, its launch sales are, this is purely based on physical as well. Its launch sales were a third bigger than the previous Mario Party game, which is Mario Party Superstars. Across the whole of Europe, it's like 20% up Mario Party, this game over the previous game. It's not quite rivaled Echoes of Wisdom overall, but in some countries, that's the Zelda game that came out in September. In some countries, it's actually outperformed Zelda. Oh, wow. Um, and um, so not overall, like that's not, that no, but, won't be the case when you see the overall numbers. But no, but certain it, territories, yeah. Certain territories, it's done exceptionally well. And I, I would like to think, well, well done Nintendo for that one. Yeah. I, didn't, I, I love it. I, here's the thing, I find this market really hard to predict. But Nintendo Switch seems to be pretty predictable. <laughs> like, you know, Zelda did roughly what I thought Zelda was going to do, which is rare this year. Every single time I think a game's going to do this, it does either way more or way less. Um, but Mario Party Jamboree has 
been a Nintendo game which has exceeded my expectations. So well done to Nintendo there as well. Um, um, but yeah, so not I don't really have a particular game. Obviously, we're building up now to the Call of Duty numbers, right? That's this week, yeah. and um, that will be next week's numbers, of course. But um, um, uh, but yeah, it's been a uh, it's been an interesting couple of weeks. Um, and the Sakana data, it's nice to say Sakana data now. We're sort of within within the month of the month it's on. We've they've been out of de- they've been out of sync quite a while now, and we only had the August data, I think, mid October. Um, so to get the September data, uh, uh, you know, less than a month after the after it closed, is, is great to see, and hopefully that continues. If they get to get to the point where they're uh, delivering the numbers before the games come out, that's done you out of a job. Oh, that <laughs> does all out of a job, yeah. <laughs> it's all out of a job. Um, brilliant. Thank you so much, Chris. I think we're going to wrap it up there because uh, we have gone on slightly longer than I, I planned to do. Um, Shall we change the name of the podcast, Jack? No, we really should. <laughs> we really should. <laughs> Ironically, I have just changed it to microcast. So it used to be that you searched for the GameStreet.biz podcast on all the platforms of your choice. But because we keep calling it the microcast, it's now the microcast on all platforms. And do you know what? No, I'm sticking to it it's still micro compared to most other games podcasts so um thank you so much for joining us uh, dear listeners you if you're not already subscribed as i say you can subscribe on the podcasting platform of your choice to search for the gamesry.biz microcast you can get all the latest news delivered straight to your inbox via the gi daily that's gamesry.biz slash newsletters you can get more news insight and analysis into the world behind video games at gamesindustry.biz chris and i will be back next week assuming you haven't <laughs> suffered even more with your lurgy your post egx lurgy um thank you so much we will be back next Monday.